Thank you all for being here, and certainly the, the ministers, uh, and of course our, our host, uh, Minister Michael Gallagher, but also, of course, Ministers George Suris and, uh, and Robin Parker, and of course all our members of Parliament who have just had various conversations, because as you probably know, the bell will go very soon, and all our local members of uh, Parliament and uh, ministers uh, obviously have to be called back to their duty and deliberations. So I'm being prepared and preparing you that at 2 o'clock there'll be a, a bell and it might actually go for about 30 seconds. So uh, we'll just persevere when it, when it does happen. But um, I'd certainly like to uh, acknowledge and thank all those uh, members that are here. It's been uh, great to have so many of our, our local members. And in fact, uh, as the Minister did mention, I think it is a record to uh, have uh, the number of ministers that we have in the Hunter region at present and also, of course, having so many of our local members uh, here from both sides of Parliament uh, here uh, today, so it's, um, <coughs> it's great. Also, of course, to have our uh, local mayors from uh, uh, the Lord Mayor, of course, of Newcastle and the, the Mayor of Port Stephens and Musselbrook, um, and also, of course, the Deputy Mayor for, for Wyom, and, uh, of course, our, our board members as well. So thank you all for coming along. It's, it's a tradition that we've had here in the, uh, for the Foundation. It goes back uh, 48 years. Uh, began soon after the foundation was uh, formed and it was really a mechanism to try and develop the communication between the research foundation, the, uh, the region and uh, in Sydney. I guess in, in those early days major decisions were defined as um, those that affected the HVRF sponsorship and support and uh, of course those major decisions were often made in Sydney. So fortunately now most of those uh, significant decisions are uh, made within the region and uh, while it's, uh, we have those local connections, it's still important to maintain this link between uh, ourselves and the Hutter region. So uh, for, I guess, the last 20 years, we've been holding it here in Parliament House, and uh, we have had uh, support from both members of, of the House in terms of uh, supporting the Hutter and supporting the Hutter Valley Research Foundation. So I'm uh, very uh, grateful for the, uh, the Minister for the Hunter to actually uh, host us here in his, uh, his new capacity uh, today. Um, it'd be under it would be an understatement to, uh, to say that uh, so much has changed uh, here in, uh, in Parliament House, but uh, in terms of political representation, but in fact um, many of the challenges that are facing the Hunter region remain the same. And in a nutshell, it's uh, the challenge is how do we manage growth and change while maintaining the quality of life which is important to the people who call the Hunter home. I just want to start off by giving a little bit of a, uh, a story about a recent trip I made throughout Western New South Wales and gave me an opportunity to reflect about uh, the experiences that we're having in the Hunter region compared to other regions throughout uh, New South Wales, particularly those small rural communities that are dot dotted around west of the divide. So even though they're having a, a relatively good season in the west and uh, there's adequate water, there's an appearance of a, um, a great uh, growing condition for uh, rural producers, there's a continual quest for uh, productivity improvements um, through innovation and uh, this has meant ongoing pressure on employment in rural regional New South Wales. In fact, in the northwest, what looks like an excellent um, cotton crop is uh, now able to be produced with many fewer people than was the case only a few years ago. Genetically modified cotton is now uh, Roundup ready, which means that uh, fewer cotton chippers are required, a need which used to, be, uh, used to employ a substantial number of lower skilled people in previous years. Driving past the cotton farms uh, during the harvest, one can see two similar operations with very different outcomes. One, one of the operations was using the uh, the new generation of cotton pickers that produce very large uh, plastic wrap round bales that have dropped out of the back of the, uh, of the picker, very similar to those uh, round hay bales that you'd see. Um, the, that one machine or that machine has one driver. And then in the next property you can see uh, pickers that are going around uh, taking the cotton to central dumping areas and then uh, putting them into the large rectangular bales which are the more traditional approach. That operation takes probably about eight to ten people. So uh, innovation can be uh, can be good for employment if it produces new products and uh, and services. But in the con but in this context, um, innovation could reduce the demand for labour from one fifth to one tenth of, um, of what it was. 
And although there's been a lot of focus on water and the water issues in the West, it's these technological changes, um, together with the socio-demographic changes that uh, are associated with uh, the ageing farming workforce and farmers, and also the fact that they've got fewer sons and daughters who are willing to uh, take on the vagaries of life on the land, which will continue to put pressure on the sustainability of small country towns as people move to the coast and people move to the places like the Hutter region. So it does raise the issue of do people follow jobs or jobs follow people? And there's plenty of evidence that if work is available and the pay and living conditions are enticing enough, people will follow jobs. And the mining sector, of course, is a case in point with uh, many people going to remote areas because of the location of a job. But however, when that, that job no, is long, no longer available, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, the resource runs out, for example, then those people will leave those areas. And this relationship between residence and employment has become even more tenuous as the fly-in, fly-out approach uh, has been taken in recent times, particularly remote areas of Australia. Yet in the coastal areas uh, such as the Hunter, there's plenty of evidence of jobs following people. These places have increasing population levels because they're the nice places to live or retire to, and are often the places that have the largest increases in jobs as the populations demand a wide range of services. The Hunter appears unique in having both these forces operating at the same time. We're obviously enjoying the benefits of the commodity boom with the unemployment levels in the upper Hunter reaching record lows, around 2% to 3% with all local government areas in the Hunter now recording population growth. With Lake Macquarie recording the largest increase in numbers, now over 200,000 people, while Maitland, Cessnock, Musselbrook and Gloucester have the largest percentage increases. In fact, these four local government areas are the fastest growing local government areas in percentage terms in New South Wales, outside, metropolitan, outside the city metropolitan area, with the exception of uh, uh, Palerang Council, which is located next to Queanbeyan uh, and the ACT. As we are seeing the substitution of technology and capital for labour in western New South Wales, we've also seen the substitution in the hunter, particularly in the mining industry. We've seen substantial increases in productivity with bigger machines and the development of associated infrastructure such as, such as the loading facilities in the port of Newcastle. Our port statistics, as recorded in our Hunter region of the Glance publication, which is on your table, shows that the coal throughput rose to over 102 million tonnes last year, an increase of 11% on the previous year. However, while the coal reserves in the Hunter contribute to most of New South Wales coal exports and power generation, the mining sector still only makes a relatively small part of the labour force. While some of the employment information is census derived, other data comes from the labour force survey which has a degree of variability, particularly at the regional and local level. And that's why this year's census will be so important in that it will shed further light on the changes in productivity over the last five years in this and other industries. While I've spoken about mining, the hunter is a lot more than that. In fact, 96% of the labour force is engaged in other sectors of the economy. Manufacturing, retailing, healthcare and social assistance make up 35% of the jobs in the regional economy. At a local level, uh, this can vary between local government areas. For example, in the Upper Hunter and Gloucester councils, they have a substantial agricultural uh, sector and industries, particularly with regards to cattle and horses. In fact, the diversity of the regional economy is what gives it its resilience. If we define resilience as the ability uh, to bounce back after a major setback, a resilient re region will be more sustainable than a region which is not. The hunters demonstrated this resilience on numerous occasions, but three separate examples come to mind in the last 22 years. One being the region's ability to bounce back after the Newcastle earthquake in 1989. The second, its ability to bounce back after the closure of BHP steelmaking plant in 1999. And the third was the ability to bounce back after the so-called Pasha Balka storm of 2007. In fact, the region seems to emerge from these events with a new energy that has been reflected in a level of job growth which has outstripped population growth for a number of years. We've looked at resilience at numerous levels using indicators such as the proportion of local employment in the top 10 industries 
while at the household level we've been collecting information as part of our community wellbeing research on how households deal with financial emergency or crises. We're also collecting unique information about the level of innovation across industries within the region, which seems to be helping with new product development rather than employment reduction. Such measures are critical in understanding the challenges and opportunities facing local communities. It's difficult to develop such an understanding without reliable statistical data and analysis, of course, the title of my uh, uh, talk. Um, and we're fortunate in Australia to have a group like, or have a group such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which I believe The Economist magazine ranked as one of the top, if not the top, national statistical agency in the world. But also because our census is undertaken every five years instead of the 10 year time gap endured in places such as the US. As you've heard, this uh, year's census will no doubt provide us with greater insights into how our communities are changing and enable us to develop recommendations for facing the future. The Foundation uses ABS census data along with the information collected through our own surveys to look at both the short and long term trends. We believe this type of information is critical not only for business planning, but also for evidence-based policy development. For example, we regularly collect regional information on areas such as community environmental attitudes towards water recycling, green energy consumption, nuclear power and the perceived benefits and costs of the coal industry. We also have regular surveys on computer and the internet and internet usage. And just as a, an aside for those interested, when we began asking questions about purchasing goods and services online in 2000, only 6% of households said they had purchased something in the last 12 months. And in March 2011, 60% of people said they'd bought something online in the last 12 months, and you can understand why Jerry Harvey is getting a bit anxious. Of course, we're also collecting and using information for our economic indicators, our assessment of community wellbeing, and together with our partners, collecting information on travel behaviour and community health, all critical to the future planning of our local areas, the regions and the state. There are many ways people acquire and utilise information. Some use intuition, some take on board those with experience and authority, what they might say. Yet the most reliable information is that which has been developed through the scientific approach to research based on a philosophy of rationalism and empiricism. In other words, we need to use a combination of logic, observation and measurement to understand the world around us. Whether it's the physical or social sciences, the same rules apply to the development of reliable and valid information to assist you in your decision making. We take pr great pride in applying this rigour to all our research, whether it be our internal research program or our contract research activities. In finishing, <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of you for your support. Our sponsors, board members, staff, uh, they make a great team which has maintained a unique approach to regional development and delivered great benefits to our many clients and our regional communities. Thank you all for coming today.